Um, I'm really pleased today to be here with my colleagues from the COPIN project to talk about open access monographs, their infrastructures, their funding models, and their developments. Um, my name is Martin Paul Eve, uh, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the landscape as it stands, um, and hopefully also some background that will uh, inform our breakout groups and discussions in the workshops. So just um, by way of personal introduction, uh, I am Professor of Literature, Technology and Publishing at Birkbeck College at the University of London. I am the author of nine books, all of which are OA monographs, they're open access. And I've had long-standing interest in developing equitable funding structures in particular for open access in the humanities disciplines, where we often find it difficult to uh, gather APC funding for journals or book processing charge funding um, in the book space. I guess it's worth just backing up a little bit uh, for this framing session and just to ask, why does open access matter? Why does it matter for books and why does it matter at this point? It seems abundantly clear to me that COVID-19 was the sharp end expose of a crumbling research publication infrastructure in the humanities and social sciences. Um, as anyone who knows my Twitter feed will uh, know about me, I'm clinically extremely vulnerable. And during the pandemic period, when suddenly I was locked out of research libraries in lockdowns, it became virtually impossible to conduct my research work at home without access to those print infrastructures. It seemed to me that COVID-19 exposed the need for digital and uniformly open access to even long form writing in these spaces. But I also appreciate that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, also gave us the sharp end of budgetary constraints and a tidal wave of anxiety about institutional finance followed that initial period of um, lockdowns. I think also though, um, those who recognize the structure of the publishing industry are also aware that over the past few decades, the profile of the monograph and its sales have changed quite radically. Press sustainability has been threatened by um, de demand-driven acquisition in part, which delivers only a fraction of the revenue required to produce a book um, every time it's accessed. And the number of sales of titles that can be expected at presses has gone um, through the floor, to put it politely. Open access then could offer us increased readership, usage and citation of these volumes. And we're also seeing a number of funder mandates coming through that are pushing for long form writing, the research monograph, to be made openly accessible. Indeed, we know that we're in the middle at the moment of a changing policy landscape and that things are shifting quite rapidly. So we had the recent UKRI review in the UK that has stated that um, from 2024, open access will be extended to monographs that are published under UKRI funded um, umbrellas. I suppose uh, in the UK context, we all know that UKRI project funding is only a sliver of the entire output in monographs or any other research space. And really what we're waiting on at the moment is the REF review, which will think about the conditions under which monographs can be submitted to the next REF here. Um, the ministerial steer is that there should be a stronger push for open access. Um, the policy wonk steer is that ideally REF policy will be harmonized with UKRI um, statements. And so, you know, if I were gazing into my crystal ball at this point, I'd probably say, well, you know, the REF policy will look a lot like the UKRI policy. What we're not clear on is how that will be funded. And I suppose I, in this opening talk today, I'm going to talk about the challenges of funding in particular and what we're doing to pilot some business models to transition existing university presses to models for open access books. Because the fundamental truth is, however you, you look at this problem, book processing charges do not scale well or fairly among libraries. And the way you can think about this is if you had, say, 100 people in a room and you needed 100 pounds to run an event. The two ways you could do that is you could ask everybody in the room to pay one pound um, and they can afford that and everybody pays their pound and the event can run because essentially you've got the money you need. 
if you think about the analogy to a book processing charge, it's equivalent to just going to the speaker and asking them up front for £100 in order to speak. And often the money is not there. It's not with that speaker. It's distributed among the many actors in the system. And that's exactly what we have in the library funding landscape for books. The sales system works relatively well at distributing costs between many different libraries. Uh, the book processing charge model is incredibly problematic and starts to exclude people based on their inability to pay them. I should say also, though, that the benefits of open access should not be thought of in financial savings terms, but really in terms of the usage of these artefacts. We often get hung up on um, the humanities being unwanted, unloved, the social sciences unread and so on. But a good case study from one of the presses we're working with at the CEU Press was that during just March to June 2020, they made 279 titles openly accessible on Project Muse. These titles were downloaded 350,000 times over just those few months from 129 countries, and seven of the top 10 downloads were from titles that were over 10 years old. So the backlist saw extensive usage. And you know, every time presses do this and make their books openly accessible, we suddenly see explosive explosions in the usage levels of these titles, which to me speaks to an unmet opportunity. Um, there is an audience for this work. We're just not doing the best we can at the moment to get these works in front of the people who would like to, to read them. And that's where open access for monographs could be of great use. Should also point out that we're dealing with quite a strange landscape here compared to the journal space. Um, lots of people have been familiar with the transition of journals to open access models, and we can get a good profile of what that landscape looks like from the directory of open access journals. But if you compare the directory of open access books to the directory of open access journals, you quickly see that the open access books market has many smaller players with publications in multiple languages across a broad spectrum of subject areas. Um, and this is an infrastructure that is valued in different disciplinary contexts. So um, there are a large number of small to medium sized university presses, for example, who are uh, intensely valued in particular subject areas. You know, they're not the mega presses of Cambridge, Oxford, MIT, but nonetheless, they will be the specialist press in a particular area. They'll have commissioning expertise. They will have um, a value among disciplinary practices and need support. And I'm going to propose today that we need to think of supporting these types of mission driven presses as though they were part of the research infrastructure for the humanities, borrowing from the language that Charles Watkinson has been using um, in the US for a while. And often people come back on that and say, well, why, why do we need to support this in infrastructure? Why do we need to think about supporting presses holistically rather than just buying the books that we want once we know that they're successful? And the basic answer is that if we could predict in advance at a press which books are important, which books are the ones that will go on to make a difference in the world, then we'd have solved a massive problem in research, which is simply that we can't do that. We don't know ahead of time which bits of research are the things that will change the world that are the important ones that take off. Um, just by way of analogy to the fiction space, Samuel Beckett, Nobel Prize winning novelist and, and playwright, uh, had his first manuscript rejected 18 times by presses before it was picked up. And we have the same in the research space. You can't have the cream without the milk. And presses need to publish a wide range of materials so that we can find out where the, where that important research is. And that's why I think we need to start thinking of this as something that needs to be continuously supported rather than just buying the titles once we know that they're successful. It's quite an exciting time, though, for open access monographs. In the last year or so, we've seen a number of experimental business models come forward, piloting the way that we might uh, produce OA monographs without resorting to book processing charges. And this is a little simplified, but I'm going to talk about them as though they were part of three different strata. Um, so at the very top end of um, mega presses, we have MIT Press's direct open scheme, which came through which is a front list unlocking mechanism where uh, libraries subscribe to the front list at the press. And if they get enough subscribers, the entire front list for that year can be made openly accessible. 
Uh, Cambridge University Press also launched its Flip to Open, Flip It Open scheme, which is a model where uh, once a book has recovered its costs and gone beyond a certain threshold of sales, they will make those books open access. Um, that's great in many ways, um, but it does mean that only the books that uh, were successful rather than these research monographs are getting the benefits of open access. Now, those presses have uh, institutional subsidy supports. They have often large grants to support this work that they're doing at the moment. Um, and I don't want to knock that. You know, it's good that they're doing this. But there are also presses at the small to medium end here who are in a very different boat. So I also I want first to tip my hat to the scholar-led born open access presses, Punctum Books, Open Book Publishers, Mattering Press, uh, who have instigated membership schemes to support their operations over the past few years. So these are collective models where libraries contribute um, a membership fee to support those presses ongoing operations so that they don't have to charge book processing charges. Um, and that's great. And by the way, um, my experience of working with open book publishers and Punctum Books uh, for two of my works was incredibly positive, as good as any university press I've ever been with. So um, just to put in a good word for them. I'm going to talk for the rest of my uh, sort of five five minutes now, though, about what we do with these small to medium sized university presses and what we're doing at the Coping Project to come up with a model that works for them. Uh, these presses often receive some but not much subsidy from their host institutions, um, and they're really falling in that um, gap between these two spaces of scholar led and large, well funded academic presses. Traditionally, they'd put their titles into Knowledge Unlatched, and that would be the way they'd do it. But we obviously know that Knowledge Unlatched is now owned by Wiley, and so that may not be as value aligned as it was in the past with library goals. Uh, we also know that these presses um, need models that don't put their entire operation at jeopardy just to try something in the OA space. And that's the model that we've come up with at COPIM for these presses, which is called Opening the Future, that I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about now. So opening the future is a backlist subscription model for opening the front list at a press. And the idea is that presses put together packages of their titles. So the Central European University Press, one of our partners, has presses in history, politics and Slavic studies, for example. And there's 50 books in each package. Libraries can subscribe to those 50 books. And that's just a subscription. There's nothing open access about that. It's 50 books for your local collection. What's different about the model is that the publisher uses the revenue from that subscription to make the front list openly accessible one book at a time as they hit the revenue threshold for that book. And in this way, what we're trying to do is give libraries something that they can buy with their traditional acquisitions budget, but that by stealth almost ends up funding open access. And that's how we can start to see a transition from funding books for a local collection to funding the building of a global collection that everybody wants. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that humanities and social sciences are well funded and that we can charge the earth for this. So the smallest um, universities in this scheme are paying just 300 pounds for those books to subscribe to and the largest just a thousand. So half a single APC to support a scheme like this. And our target is to get to the point where these presses can produce their front lists, uh, their research monograph front lists entirely openly accessible. So the collection grows by 25 titles every year. Um, we're working with Project Muse for metadata. So this is high quality Mark KBART with counter compliance statistics. Um, and we'll also talk to you later today a bit about our system TOTE at COPIM, which is an open metadata dissemination system. Um, but I don't want to muddy the water at this point. What's important is that with a collective model like this, um, as more members join, the cost goes down. And if we can get to our target number of libraries, we're looking at just 10 pounds per library per monograph, and the front list of those monographs is all open access. So really this is an extremely cost-effective way compared to a book processing charge of supporting these presses to convert their front list to openly accessible models. 
So we're piloting this with Liverpool University Press and the Central European University Press. So two presses that have extensive backlists and can support this type of system for up to 40 years actually with, the, with their backlist. Um, the backlist is DRM free. It's massively concurrent access, so you can do what you like with it. We're not putting any um, lockdown restrictions on those titles. Um, and after three years, it's perpetual access for libraries to the books they're subscribing to. So there's no hidden lock, locks on these books. Um, they're just available for researchers to download and use as they see fit, and you get perpetual access at the end of that term. But what I like about this model, and this is what we built in in the design, is that we're trying to work incrementally here. Lots of models have set their sights on all or nothing and said, if we hit our library membership threshold, we'll make our entire list open access. And that's you know, a laudable goal. But what it often means is we don't hit the target and then we get nothing instead. In opening the future, we unlock one book at a time and it's simply the next book coming through production. So there's none of this question about, are they selecting the worst titles to make them open access and palming them off on libraries? It's simply, this book is about to go into production. We haven't said whether it's open access or, or for sale yet. And if we've got the revenue from 10 memberships to this system, we'll make that next book open access. And we're also signaling that clearly to libraries. So there's no um, accidental double dipping where a library goes in and buys a title that it's already funded to be open access. So clear metadata signaling in advance and a clear um, warning ahead of time for which titles are OA and which are um, for purchase. What this model is not and what we're trying to get away from is a read and publish deal. So we're very used to these now in the journal space, seeing um, transformative agreements where it's for researchers at your institution to publish open access. We're trying to change the way we think about this so that anybody who goes to the press can publish open access without a book processing charge. By converting the entire front list of the press to open access, we get around this problem of, is this book from our researcher? It's just that the entire press is working on an open access basis. So that's my kind of introduction to the policy landscape and to what we're doing business model wise to try to convert um, open access um, existing university presses to OA models. And my take home message um, for this audience today, though, is that we're going to be talking about a lot of pilots. We're going to be talking about a lot of experiments and things we're doing at this time to try to change things. And it's very tempting at this point, especially given the pandemic budget constraints, to sit back and think, let's see what happens. And the problem is that if we sit back and just see what happens rather than supporting these pilots, um, it's going to be another decade before we just have another set of pilots and another set of pilots. And the pilots will never become what we do as basic practice. So I guess my plea is, what can we do? This is a plea and a question. What can we do? to make this more than just a pilot phase and make it the beginning of a true transition to open access for monographs, um, the beginning of a different way of doing things in these disciplines. Um, I'm gonna now hand over to my colleague, uh, Joe Deville, who's gonna talk a bit more about the infrastructural side of what we're doing at COPIM and uh, the way that intersects with scholar-led. Yes, didn't we say that we'd also just go around the room and just ask everyone just to uh, you know, just summarize one point from their breakout sessions? I think that's right. Is that right? Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Martin. Um, so yeah, I think we'll begin with that. I just be, I mean, we don't we we'll spend too long doing it because um, obviously time is of the essence. Um, if, if your breakout room was anything like mine, you know, we could have talked for at least another half an hour. But anyway, um, perhaps I'll just begin with one thought, one thing that came up in our discussions, which was this kind of question of how libraries navigate the, this changing landscape where they are being presented with more and more uh, models um, for open access and where um, you know, um, the way that the library budgets are allocated might be changing in some cases and not in other cases. And I think for me, what was most kind of hopeful um, is hearing from some institutions where that sort of traditional um, separation between kind of content acquisition and supporting open access is breaking down. And you're actually having more and more conversations across silos. And ultimately, I'm thinking, you know, in the round about what do we want to support 
and and why um, without just having to sort of say oh we can only support open access from this defined open access pot we did hear from one institution that has such a pot and you know and they're there which is fantastic um, but they're now increasingly struggling to fund because they're getting so many um, asks for, from that pot. So I think that's a really crucial thing that needs to happen from our perspective in libraries is, is that those silos break down. And it's good to hear that, that in some cases is starting to happen. So Martin, perhaps over to you. Sorry, everyone, you can hear, hear a little bit more from me. Um, well, we had a, a wide ranging discussion in our breakout room, but I guess the, the core things that came through were um, it's helpful to start to normalize expenditure on OA monographs as expenditure on monographs and, and getting beyond this separation of scholarly communications from acquisitions budgets, um, which seemed a really important and recurrent theme. Um, but also, you know, thinking about this in two ways, I, I wanted to highlight that another conversation we have is about accessibility as an overlooked aspect of OA and ensuring that actually access for everyone is really part of what we're doing here and not just thinking of access in monetary terms, but also in terms of disability accessibility and so on. Thanks, Martin. And Lucy? Yeah, so we touched on um, the topic of uh, different pots of money as well. Um, but a point that we were circling around quite a lot was this um, idea of tipping points and what is the, 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 the thing that will trigger the tipping point into OA for monographs. So there was quite a lot of discussion about policy and a feeling that, um, you know, policy moves, particularly the next ref, are going to be important. Um, but there's also a certain amount of anxiety around that for less well-resourced universities. And, you know, if the model is BPCs, then how is that going to be funded? And even if it's lots of small, um, you know, little pots of money that are required for, for schemes um, which charge less than a BPC, still that's a financial commitment. And how do you balance um, those different things, especially if there's quite a lot of them? So that was kind of what came out of our, our discussions. Excellent. Thank you. Really interesting to hear. Thanks, Lucy. And Tom? Um, I, I won't go into too much detail because actually we talked about a lot of the things you, you all mentioned. Um, I'll just bring up one one sentence that stuck in my head from a colleague at Leeds who said, um, so much of what you can do is dictated by what your institution is doing. Um, and so even if you and your immediate colleagues know it's the right thing to do, um, you may not actually be able to do it yeah. uh, in terms of supporting OA. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Brad. And welcome welcome to the felines in the room. This is, this is Pod. Hi, Pod. Uh, Toby. Um, I think all of, or most of uh, what has been covered in our conversation has also been uh, touched upon in what you've spoken about. So um, maybe I'll just keep it short here and yeah. Yeah, and well, back well, to it's good to, hear that, <laughs> good to hear that there are some resonances between the different rooms. Um, so that's, that's good. Okay, all right then. So yeah, um, now I'm gonna move on um, to talk about some of the work that, that I'm doing on the Copeland project. Martin's already sort of trailed it in a way in talking about the, the, the challenges that face um, smaller to medium publishers in securing OA funding. And um, I've been working uh, with colleagues, with Eileen Joy from Humpton Books and other colleagues, Rupert Gatti from Open Book Publishers and, and others um, on developing um, some solutions or hopefully, hopefully solutions to some of these challenges. So I'm just gonna uh, share my slides. Here we go, let's have a look. Okay, uh, let's go like that, that should work. Okay, right, um, can you see that? And someone, Toby, can you confirm that that's, you can see that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, a new uh, organization that is in the process of being founded titled called the Open Book um, Collective. Martin's also gonna be speaking later on uh, in the presentation about um, a infrastructure development that's connected to the Open Book Collective, which is another kind of output of the Copen project, which in a way stands on its own, but also provides a really important function for the work of the Open Book Collective. Okay, here's a very quick overview of, uh, of what the Open Book Collective is and what it stands for. So as it sort of says on the left there, you know, what the Open Book, Book Collective tries to do is to bring together different entities in the, the pub open publishing landscape, publishers, publishing service providers, and then also research institutions. So um, like Martin was talking about, you know, another initiative that tries to bridge um, the work of research institutions and those that are developing content. 
Um, and what we want to do is, 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 is harness, I guess, the power of collaboration across these different um, stakeholders, stakeholders is to secure the future of, um, of open access book length and long form scholarship. On the right, there are some of the values um, of this new uh, organization. So a care and curation of high quality academic books, a commitment to biblio diversity, um, collaboration and resource sharing over competition, networked community building over profit driven centralization, horizontal working relationships over exclusive forms of hierarchization and uh, growing and safeguarding open accessibility to and reuse of academic books for global readers without technical or economic barriers. So you already get a sense from that about, I guess, what some of the values are that are informing the Open Book Collective, and that is reflected in lots of different ways in, um, in our governance structure and the kinds of initiatives that we want to support via, uh, via the collective. But I'll come back to some of that. What I'm going to do now is move on to thinking about practically what the Open Book Collective will do. And the Open Book Collective, to be clear, is going to do different things. But at the centre of the Open Book Collective's work is a, a platform that tries to address some of the challenges of small to medium publishers and also service providers um, in securing funding for their work. OK, so the particular challenge that we kind of began with uh, in the project is this. You have, as Martin already mentioned, some small academic led presses that have uh, existing library membership programs. Um, they offer those library membership programs in particular to libraries and universities. And if um, they're lucky, uh, they get financial support in return. Um, there are other um, initiatives that do something similar, infrastructural initiatives. So, for example, Director of Open Access Books has a library membership scheme, and sometimes they're successful in, um, in securing subscriptions for those um, schemes. Um, however, there are a number of publishers in this kind of landscape and also infrastructure providers that don't have library membership schemes. So Matching Press, the press that I'm working with, you know, we're a very, very small publisher. We publish, let's say, an average of three to four books a year. It actually varies a lot. You know, one year it's one year, one book, next year it's eight you know, or nine books we published in one year. It makes it hard for us to offer our own individual library membership scheme because we're, we're small and our, our output is, is, is variable. Um, so what, what, what can we do for those, these kind of publishers to help them secure their funding, as well as make it easier for those slightly larger publishers to uh, reach out to universities? As we've already heard about in the breakout rooms, um, when it comes to assessing the different initiatives that already uh, exist out there, there are some uh, real, uh, no, sorry, when it comes to the, the open access initiatives themselves and doing their outreach work for those that do have uh, um, programs, they, um, there, are, there are challenges. So the outreach work is highly labor intensive. The outreach tends to be geographically skewed. So initiatives tend to focus on the, you know, the country that they're based in and that, where they have networks and so on. Uh, the outreach rewards are uncertain. Um, and what that means is, although library membership schemes can be a useful tool, um, it's the, nonetheless, you still have BPC based publishing models at the heart of many open access publishers, you know, um, Punctum uh, and, uh, and open book publishers still take fees, they don't make it a mandatory requirement for publishing open access, but a lot of their work is funded through fees that they ask authors to see if they can um, secure. This places barriers to entry for, for smaller initiatives um, like, matching, like Matching Press and also uh, for larger initiatives, uh, as I say, these uh, the rewards are uncertain. The situation also generates um, challenges for libraries and universities. So there are inconsistencies in how initiatives present themselves. As we've already heard about, it's really labor intensive to assess for libraries to assess the increasing number of asks that they're be, um, getting from uh, initiatives. And ob obviously, as we've also, well, in my breakout session, heard about, you know, libraries want evidence of how a different initiative might be relevant to them, to their faculty, to their students, to their priorities. Um, what we at the Open Book Collective are trying to do is try to address some of these problems. So we're starting with the same challenge to some extent. You know, we have on the one side, we have um, publishers and um, with library membership programs and the, and the other, we have uh, libraries and universities. But what we're um, doing with the Open Book Collective is setting up a financial intermediary. So what we will do is we will um, advertise uh, library membership programs on the platform for which uh, we will then um, 
uh, manage these subscriptions and direct payment to individual initiatives, whether publishers or infrastructure providers. What we'll also do on the platform is allow the formation of new collectives. So for the presses like my own, like Matching Press, for Mison Press, which is the other uh, logo below it, um, as well as perhaps some other um, uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructural initiatives, we will make it possible for the platform to, to offer collective packages and to receive revenue for those collective packages. So it allows these smaller initiatives to still potentially receive some revenue without being beholden um, to uh, providing, you know, a kind of very, very regular form of, of output. So that being part of a collective will, at, will allow um, individual output to vary, but you'll still have um, the, the, the kind of a consistency of output across um, a group. And um, we'll also potentially host um, other uh, types of presses on the platform. Martin talked about opening the future. Um, we hope um, that we will, when at the point of launch, have some of the opening the future presses uh, on the platform, offering their uh, library membership schemes and potentially other open access books and book initiatives. We are actually in conversation with a number and it may well be that some of you here in the room um, might uh, be the kind of initiative that could benefit from being part of the Open Book Collective. And, and if that is the case, I'd really encourage you to get in touch with us and to have um, to start those conversations because, yeah, we're really keen to, to build a, a collective, a group of publishers and infrastructure providers that are, have offerings on the platform. It's worth saying as well um, that, of course, the platform will allow um, payments to pass via, uh, via third parties um, consortium membership organizations, for example. So that's the kind of financial intermediation part of the platform, but it does something else. It also provides information. Initiatives, groups of initiatives provide information to the platform, and then that information is then passed to, to libraries or to their, uh, to their representatives. And I guess the, the point here is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this, easy, this information easier for libraries to deal with, so to ensure that information is clear, it's consistent, there's clear information on the packages that are being offered, clear information on the values of different initiatives, how they're structured. Um, from the library's perspective, that the, the metadata that these initiatives, um, when it comes to publishers and um, supply, is consistent. Um, the, 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 there is an easy way of browsing the catalogues of different initiatives. So we'll have a shared catalog based uh, on the, the tote backend that Martin's going to talk about uh, in the second for those publishers that put their information in this catalog. And crucially as well, information on the local relevance of initiatives to institutions so that the institution can um, get a sense of how the, uh, the content, for example, of a publisher might relate to the priorities of their faculty, of their um, staff. So hopefully one thing it will do is make it easier for libraries to understand the relevance of particular institutions. It also help with invoicing, contracting, um, all these different ways that we can help make the process of supporting different initiatives less painful. Okay, I'm just gonna hand over to Martin now who's gonna talk more about TOTE and the back end upon which uh, Open Book Collective um, depends to a significant degree. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's a real problem with open access books that seems completely ironic, which is that the metadata for them and their discoverability uh, is often extremely poor. And this is not usually actually the fault of presses who are providing often high quality metadata, but it goes through several layers of aggregator uh, who tend to strip it out by the time it gets to libraries. Um, a good example of this is simply the fact that we can't easily put a flag saying that um, a particular work is open access, for instance, and that then leads to situations where libraries end up accidentally purchasing uh, more uh, titles that they've already funded to be open access. Um, so one of the, the things we've been working on at the Copin project is an open mess data dissemination system for books that is built from the ground up to accommodate open access books, um, their affordances and characteristics. Um, it's an open API um, and it's using open standards, open metadata and open source code. And this integrates either directly with library discoverability systems, but we're also in conversations with the directory of open access books and OAPEN. Uh, to ensure that presses using this system can filter their data into those systems which are um, 
already integrated with library discoverability and, and cataloging systems. This also plugs a huge infrastructural gap in that lots of presses end up using systems like Books for Onyx, which are commercial uh, solutions to, to give them metadata feeds that, that are in the formats that libraries need. Um, we think we can do this much better if we if we work from scratch, thinking about open access as the default. And so um, that's where Tote comes in. And you can see more about that at tote.pub, T-H-O-T-H dot pub, um, where you can explore some sample catalogs and, and see the kind of records that we're now able to export. And really, this is going to be a huge boon for presses that can't um, afford uh, those commercial solutions and also gives them the power to sh to shape their own catalogues in ways that will filter through accurately uh, to libraries okay joe how's that <laughs> yeah excellent thanks very much and yeah just to note to say the matching press my press we just input our data into tote and yeah it's you know it's really really incredibly in 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 invaluable for us to help you know us manage our metadata much more effectively than we were doing before which was a very uh, in a very amateurish way i will confess okay yeah just now moving on to think uh, talking a little bit about the obc business model um it's maybe relevant for some of you may not be relevant for some of you but hopefully it'll just give you a sense of how we're planning to, to fund our work Okay, so the way it works practically is that the publisher or service provider will offer their membership program via the Open Book Collective, and the library then potentially will support that individual initiative, perhaps more than one initiative, and um, then will so financially, you know, pay for that um, support. Uh, and the on top of that is then added the OBC processing fee, which I'll uh, talk about more in a second, and then the OBC collects that membership program revenue uh, with the processing fee on, on top and then distributes it. So um, the publishing or service provider will receive uh, membership income from the OBC, less um, some fees, and the library will then receive, not then, but you know, over the course of their membership at different points, um, uh, the information that they need from the publisher, whether that be metadata, updates about their work, new publications and so on, as well as, for, uh, for example, for the likes of an opening the future press, um, if they uh, join the platform, um, access to the relevant uh, backlist. The OBC then distributes the income it receives into two funds. Um, there is the, the OBC Management Fund is the fund that funds the, the work of the Open Book Collective. So one of the things that the Open Book Collective does is it conducts outreach on behalf of publishers. And a lot of the funds that we will collect will go towards funding that outreach. So we will do the work of going to libraries, speaking to them about the different library membership program packages that we have on the platform, seeing if they fit with institutional priorities, seeing if it's something that an, a library will be willing to um, support. Um, there's details there about how we then allocate money to that particular fund. And, the, uh, and then a smaller portion of the money then goes to what we call the OBC Development Fund. This is a separate fund that um, allows us to support new um, publishing initiatives, new infrastructure providers, or to help existing providers improve their processes, make their work um, more efficient. And so this is in, in keeping with our remit as an organization, not just to be a kind of financial intermediary and an information provider, but an actor within the landscape of open publishing that genuinely supports a range of different initiatives in a, in a global context. As I'll come on to say in a second, we will be founded as a, as a UK and charity. So that's in, in keeping with our charitable remit. Here are some of the kind of numbers. Um, so the, 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 the processing fee that I mentioned is 5% on top um of uh of the the uh, membership program so if you know if it's a, it a 1000 pound subscription the library will pay 1050 pounds and then from, from the publisher's perspective there are the standard fee is um uh, to retain um uh five percent actually that should be uh, yeah five percent um, um from year two onwards and um, but 12.5 percent in the first year and the reason for that is because that reflects, I guess, the amount of effort that it takes to get a library to subscribe in the in the first year. Um, after as they come to renew, um, that effort uh, decreases. Okay, how much more time? I've got four more minutes. Some quick words on what we think the value of this new initiative will be. So, for the scholarly community and our uh, and open access in general. You know, this provides a sustainable, gradual funding funding model, similar to what Martin was talking about in the first session, not, not dependent on hitting fixed annual um, targets, providing new revenue source within the OA 
ecosystem that can grow over time. It becomes easier to publish open access for um, publishers as a result, helping them transition away from BPC-based publishing models. This is an openly accessible portal, I should say. I didn't really have time to talk about that before, but of course, you know, anyone can browse this. They can learn about different initiatives, learn about their values, learn about their priorities in one simple to use space, as well as browse a shared catalog. So um, uh, of the initiatives that have their metadata in, in tote. Allowing a div greater diversity in open access, you know, in, the, in line with those values of bibliodiversity that I talked about before, meaning that both small and larger uh, open access publishers can engage with libraries. You know, for matching press, this will be completely transformative. It's completely impossible for us at the moment to generate any funding from libraries, um, but this provides a really potentially valuable new um, avenue. More robust OA infrastructures, we think it's really important to support not just publishers in the world of open access, but infrastructures. And yes, as Martin said, we might want to think about publishers themselves as uh, infrastructures, but there are also these other infrastructural um, initiatives that are utterly crucial for the long-term sustainability of open access publishing. The director of open access books, TOTE, um, for example, perhaps even the open book collective in itself. Value for publishers and service providers. I think I've talked about that to some extent already, so I'll skip past that in the interest of time. Value for those who are supporting OA institutions. So I think it will become easier to demonstrate the local value of supporting open access um, initiatives. So by providing information on how individual initiatives might be relevant to your priorities, it becomes hopefully easier for, you know, to, to speak to colleagues about ex exactly breaking down those silos in budgets, for example. Reduced administration, making it easier to manage invoicing, contracting, and so on and so forth. Um, fitting, making it easier to communicate how you're um, fitting with institutional strategies, supporting diverse initiatives, and uh, also providing you know more um, open open titles. Very quick word on governance. As I mentioned, the OBC will shortly be registered as a charity in the UK. I expect that to be completed in the next few weeks. Um, there are then different boards um, uh, involved in the management of the um, book collective. Probably won't go into all the details here, but they're on the screen there. The key principle is that this is a member-led organization. Um, what we really want to avoid is a situation that's happened in the past with some initiatives where the library community gets excited about a new open access infrastructure and then that infrastructure then becomes commercial and loses some of the values that were so exciting in the first place. We want to make sure this is a, an organisation controlled by members so that that can't happen. Here's a timeline. Beta by April launch, early summer. We will um, be communicating more about that uh, in due course. I just wanted in the final minute, if I have time, if the uh, present, if the uh, organizer will allow me, just to give you a very quick sense of what this uh, will look like. Um, so let's just quickly see if I can do that. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is uh, not the live website, but some designs that have been created by our designer. So this will kind of, it will be what it will look like. Um, you'll go onto the site. Um, and then you can, depending on who you are, you can take different kinds of action. As a library, you can start to build a subscription package. As a publisher, you can find out how to, to join. I'm just going to skip through some of these slides. Um, this is what a kind of building your quotation page. You'll be able to support collectives composed of different initiatives. You'll be able to support individual uh, initiatives. And that will then uh, add to a kind of basket. I need to skip to the basket page. And uh, there's a collective catalog, individual book pages. And here's the basket page. Um, sorry. Um, so it'll uh, go back, go back. There, it'll provide you um, a total quotation for supporting different initiatives. And if an initiative is already in a collective package, it will then remove that from your quotation so you don't accidentally have a kind of double dipping scenario. You'll add some details and then we will uh, be in touch with you to discuss further and to deal with all the contracting stuff. The, the system actually does also work out the contracting in the back end as well. OK, I think that's it from me. Uh, really look forward to your thoughts, your feedback on this proposition, on anything that I've talked about. Thank you. So, um... We've just got now five minutes really to, to wrap up this session and then give people a chance to stretch their legs and, and go elsewhere. But um, thanks so much uh, to everyone in the breakout rooms for contributing and, and giving your feedback on this. 
Um, I think we're just going to do a quick summary, go around the rooms uh, to see if there, there are commonalities or, or shared points. Um, from my, my group, uh, really, what came through quite strongly was that um, the OBC could be a really useful framework for comparing the offers that, that are here. Um, we need a combination, though, of of thought. We need, well, we need to think about what metrics we're using and how sensible they are. Uh, one of the comments stuck in my mind was, we don't have sensible metrics for making these decisions yet, and we need a balance between narrative and structured information that goes back to libraries on what they're supporting and what they've achieved as a result of that support. Uh, because the academic voice is often missing from these discussions, um, but should be more prominently featured if we want this to be carrying the hearts and minds of the communities we're, we're trying to serve. Thank you. So I'll pass over to Lucy. Thanks, Martin. So we covered quite a lot of different topics in our session, um, but one of them that stuck out to me was um, that OBC's uh, one of its strong sort of selling points or you know reasons to support it is that it can simplify things for libraries, um, but that that there are some questions about um, if there are initiatives on OBC which also have separate um, ways to get support from libraries, how can that be made clear? And will those institutions or initiatives or publishers communicate that back to libraries so that they can know that when they're assessing and making a decision? Um, and we also talked a bit towards the end about uh, sort of different types of value proposition that OBC presents. So both kind of um, a sort of uh, ethical or equitable value or, you know, kind of scholarly value and also um, a kind of monetary value and how you kind of juggle those messages and the idea that, you know, really we kind of need to be presenting um, both because both issues are important to libraries in, in different ways and important to libraries in communicating upwards as well. So they kind of came out of our discussions. Brilliant, thank you, Lucy. Um, should we get Toby? Oh, yes, sure. Um, I think our discussions have also been quite fruitful um, regarding the first hand thoughts on the OBC. Um, some of the participants, part participants felt that um, uh, the presentation is, uh, or the, the OBC as uh, an overall uh, offer is quite new to them. So it's a rather difficult to give like a direct uh, reaction uh, for them to see if they can support that or not but um, they definitely feel that it'd be good to support smaller smaller initiatives and, and the proposed model seems to um, be an interesting way to um, learn more about. Um, also a very practical uh, question that came up in relation to that um, is the uh, OBC's relation to JISC. Um, um, so just the very practical question of how libraries can then route their manage uh, their their subscriptions uh, with the OBC, and we um, we explored uh, what the OBC is uh, looking at there. Um, so for example, uh, Graham, who has been on my uh, uh, room, uh, mentioned that JISC uh, uh, has been involved from the start, of course, in Copium overall and in the Open Book Collective. Um, um, gathering of th thoughts and uh, the conceptual um, building uh, the platform. And we are in active discussions with uh, uh, the JISC licensing team to get the subscription manager um, uh, lined up for that. Um, so uh, I think the, um, the reaction from our participants uh, has been quite positive on that aspect because it would, of course, help them to um, streamline the um, management of um, subscriptions through the OBC with the JISC subscription manager. Um, and maybe also to um, point to another um, thought that came up in, with, in relation to TOTE. Um, um, I think people in our group have been quite positive about uh, the notion that the records we are producing with TOTE are CC0. And also, um, it was noted that um, libraries, uh, for, for some of the libraries, there is a big issue um, with the quality of existing records in four open monographs. Um, and so, um, TOT might uh, be an interesting venture to follow up on uh, within that respect to provide um, higher quality metadata that would help their systems as well. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to go quickly to Tom and I think Joe's summarizing his in the chat because we want to give people a couple of minutes between sessions. But Tom, did you just want to close us out? Oh, an honor. Thank you, Martin. So I'll keep mine very brief and say that we had a really wide ranging discussion that touched on a lot of what you all said. Um, one takeaway for me was was the concept of where this where JISC begins and ends. Um, someone said, you know, is essentially said, is this like a, a fresh skin for the JISC licensing subscriptions manager, which was a really interesting point that we perhaps need to get right in our comms. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Brilliant. Yeah, perhaps I can just say as the final word, I won't summarize my discussion, but yeah, just to say thank you so much to everyone. And, um, you know, um, I would really encourage any of you that want to stay in touch to, yeah, um, to uh, sign up to our mailing list. And um, if there are anybody is in the room who is a publisher or represents a university press or works with a small publisher, and you think that it might, OBC might be relevant for you um, in terms of potentially, for example, having a package on the platform either now or at some future moment, please do get in touch with me. And we're already talking to some publishers around exactly that. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for all your contributions. It's been incredibly beneficial, I think, for me personally, and I'm sure for, for all of us.